we're all obsessed these days with health. So what should we be truly concerned about? If you become president, you might get shot. If you're an astronaut, you could blow up in a spaceship. You could be caught in one of these shootings we hear so much about on the news. You could be caught in an earthquake or in riots. You climb Mount Everest, you have a chance of dying or get caught into some death cult. If you were on the Titanic, wow, 1,500 people died on that. 20,000 people died in the Japanese tsunami. Chinese earthquake in 2008, 87,000 people died. Wars. Iraq war, up to 190,000. Indian tsunami, 2004, up to 280,000. Hiroshima and Nakisaki bombings, 150 to 246,000. Haiti earthquake, 316,000. Now the scale changes. American Civil War, up to 800,000. Chinese earthquake, 1556, 830,000. Genocide, up to a million. Malaria per year, 1.2 million. Total Aztec sacrifices, 1.5 million. People killed at Auschwitz, 1.5 million. The Iran-Iraq war, up to 2 million. Christian crusades, up to 3 million. Korean war, up to 4.5 million. Jews killed in the Holocaust, 6 million. World War One. 15 to 65 million. World War II, up to 72 million. But look at that. The Black Death, 1347 to 1351. 75 to 200 million. And it wasn't just in those years that you had the Black Death. It came back about 30 times, finally ceasing at the end of the six, 1600s. Antonine Plague. The Antonine Plague of 165 to 180 AD also known as the Plague of Gallen, from the name of the Greek physician living in the Roman Empire who described it, was an ancient pandemic brought back to the Roman Empire by troops returning from campaigns in the Near East. Scholars have suspected it to be either smallpox or measles, but the true cause remains undetermined. The epidemic may have claimed the life of a Roman emperor, Lucius Verus, who died in 169, and was the co-regent of Marcus Aurelius Antonius, whose family name, Anton Antoninius, has become associated with the epidemic. The disease broke out again nine years later, according to the Roman historian Dio Cassius, causing up to 2,000 deaths a day in Rome, one quarter of those who were affected, giving the disease a mortality rate of about 25%. The total deaths have been estimated at 5 million and the disease killed as much as one third of the population in some areas and devastated the Roman army. Ancient sources agree that the epidemic appeared first during the Roman siege of Seleucia in the winter of 165 to 166. Amainius Marcellinius reports that the plague spread to Gaul and the, re and the legions along the Rhine. Eutropius asserts that a large population died throughout the empire. Raffae de Crespini speculates that the plague may have also broken out in eastern Han, 
China before 166. Given notices of plagues in Chinese records, the plague affected Roman culture and literature and may have severely affected Indo-Roman trade relations in the Indian Ocean. Earlier Plague Plague of Justinian 541 to 542 AD was a pandemic that afflicted the Eastern Roman Empire especially its capital Constantinople. The Sasanian Empire and port cities around the entire Mediterranean Sea one of the deadliest plagues in history the devastating pandemic resulted in the deaths of an estimated 25 to 50 million people in two centuries of recurrence, equivalent to 13 to 26 percent of the world's population at the time of the first outbreak. The plague's social and cultural impact during the period of Justinian has been compared to that of the similar Black Death that devastated Europe 600 years after the last outbreak of Justinian plague. Procopius, the principal Greek historian of the 6th century, viewed the pandemic as a worldwide in scope. In 2013, researchers confirmed earlier speculation that the cause of the pandemic was Yersinia pestis, the bacterium responsible for plague. Ancient and modern Yersinia pestis strains closely related to the ancestor of the Justinian plague strain, have been found in Tian Shan, a system of mountain ranges on the borders of Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan and China, suggesting that the Justinian plague may have originated in or near that region. The plague returned periodically until the 8th century. The waves of disease had a major effect on the subsequent course of European history, Modern historians name this plague incident after the Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian I, who was emperor at the time of the initial outbreak. He contracted the disease himself, but survived. So this bacteria that's the cause of the Great Plague from the 1300s to the 1600s, um, the plague before that, which I think was the 6th to the 8th century, and the plague before that, um, about 150 AD, was possibly all responsible by this one type of bacteria coming from the borders of Kazakhstan and China area. And we're about, we're about overdue for one now then, aren't we? The last one went away in the late 1600s. That's exactly what they're planning, isn't it? A major fucking plague outbreak. I mean, it's not like the rats have gone. The rats are still here. There's still a rat for every single person. It's not like, you know, cities aren't overpopulated because they are massively even more. And what's happening is our immune system has been weakened they're getting rid of smoking, tobacco, they're getting, trying to get rid of burning wood, saying that's bad for you. This is their plan. <laughs> the motherfuckers, they don't want to do it themselves, they want to let it be done by this reoccurrence of a bad plague every 500 years or so. But they're preparing us so that we won't survive it can't grow food because the soil's got too much aluminium in it. This is their plan, isn't it? So, we need to fight against it to know what you need to do. You need to have wood smoke. You need cigarette smoke or wood smoke, one of them, to be inhaling it in your lungs during the summer. And probably late summer will be the most concerning time. Um, every year for the next <laughs> 50 years until we get these things sorted out. Introduction of tobacco to England. 
The most common date given for the arrival of tobacco in England is 27th of July 1586, when it is said Sir Walter Riley brought it to England from Virginia. Indeed, one legend tells of how Sir Walter's servant, seeing him smoking a pipe for the first time, threw water over him, fearing him to be on fire. However, it is much more likely that tobacco had been around in England long before this date. Tobacco had been smoked by Spanish and Portuguese sailors for many years, and it is likely that the habit of pipe smoking had been adopted by British sailors before 1586. Sir John Hawkins and his crew could have brought it to these shores as early as 1565. However, when Riley arrived back in England in 1586, he brought with him colonists from the settlements on the Roan Roanoke Island, and these colonists brought with them tobacco, maize, and potatoes. Rather bizarrely, tobacco was seen as good for your health, whereas potatoes were viewed with great suspicion. The use of tobacco by this time was well known on the continent. The Spaniard Nicolas Monades had written a report into tobacco, translated into English by John Frampton in 1577, and called of the tobacco and his great virtues, which recommended its use for the relief of toothache, falling fingernails, worms, halitosis, lockjaw, and even cancer. In 1586, the sight of the colonists puffing away on their pipes started a craze at court. It is said that in 1600, Sir Walter Riley tempted Queen Elizabeth I to try smoking. This was copied by the population as, whole, uh, as a whole, and by the early 1660s, the habit was commonplace and starting to cause concern. Hmm. <laughs> concern. When millions of people are dying of plague. <laughs> in 1604, King James I wrote a counterblast to tobacco, in which he described smoking as a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black and stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. Still, better than the plague. James imposed an import tax on tobacco, in which in 1604 was six shillings and ten pence to the pound. The Catholic Church even tried to discourage the use of tobacco by declaring its use to be sinful and banning it from holy places. Despite these warnings, the use of tobacco continued to grow. In 1610, Sir Francis Bacon noted the rise in tobacco use and that it was difficult habit to quit. At Jamestown in Virginia, 1609, colonist John Rolfe became the first settler to successfully grow tobacco, brown gold, on commercial scale. In 1614, the first shipment of tobacco was sent to England from Jamestown. Around 1638, in 1638, around £3 million of Virginian tobacco was sent to England for sale and by the 1680s, Jamestown was producing over £25 million of tobacco per year for export to Europe. With the restoration of Charles II in 1660 came a new way of using tobacco from Paris, where King had been living in exile. Snuff became the aristocracy's favourite way of enjoying tobacco. The Great Plague of 1665 saw tobacco smoke widely, widely advocated as a defence against bad air. Indeed, at the height of the plague, smoking a pipe at breakfast was actually made compulsory for the schoolboys at Eton College in London. Tobacco imports from Virginia and the Carolinas continued throughout the 17th and 18th centuries as the demand for tobacco increased and the practice of smoking became widely accepted in Britain. The Black Death was a devastating global epidemic of bubonic plague that struck Europe and Asia in the mid-1300s. The plague arrived in Europe in October 1347, when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. 
People gathered on the docks were met with a horrifying surprise. Most sailors aboard the ships were dead, and those still alive were gravely ill and covered with black boils that oozed blood and pus. Sicilian authorities hastily ordered the fleet of death ships out of the harbour, but it was too late. Over the next five years, the Black Death would kill more than 20 million people in Europe, almost one-third of the continent's population. Even before the death ships pulled into port at Messina, many Europeans had heard rumours about a great pestilence that was carving a deadly path across the trade routes of Near and Far East. Indeed, in the early 1340s, the disease had struck China, India, Persia, Syria and Egypt. However, Europeans were scarcely equipped for the horrible re reality of the Black Death. In men and women alike, the Italian poet Giovanni Boccaccio wrote, At the beginning of the malady, certain swellings, either on the groin or under the armpits, waxed to the bigness of a common apple, others to the size of an egg, some more and some less, and these the vulgar named plague boils. Blood and pus seeped out of these strange swellings, which were followed by a host of other unpleasant symptoms, fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhoea, terrible aches and pains, and then in short order, death. The Black Death was terrifyingly, indiscriminately contagious. The mere touching of the clothes, wrote Boccaccio, appeared to itself to communicate the malady to the toucher. The disease was so terrifyingly efficient. People who were perfectly healthy when they went to bed at night could be dead by morning. Today scientists understand that the Black Death, now known as the Plague, is spread by Bacillus called Yersinia pestis. The French biologist Alexandre Yersin discovered this germ at the end of the 19th century. They know that the Bacillus travels from person to person pneumonically or through the air, as well as through the bite of infected fleas and rats. Both of these pests could be found almost everywhere in medieval Europe, but they were particularly at home aboard ships of all kinds, which is how the deadly plague made its way through one European port city after another. Not long after it struck Messina, the Black Death spread to the port of Marseilles in France and the port of Tunis in North Africa. When it reached Rome and Florence, two cities at the centre of an elaborate web of trade routes. By the middle of 1348, the Black Death struck Paris, Bordeaux, Lyon and London. Today this grim sequence of events is terrifying but comprehensible. In the middle of the 14th century, however, there seemed to be no rational explanation for it. No one knew exactly how the Black Death was transmitted from one patient to another, and no one knew how to prevent or treat it. According to one doctor, for example, instantaneous death occurs when the aerial spirit escaping from the eyes of a sick man strikes the healthy person standing near and looking at the sick. Physicians relied on crude and unsophisticated techniques such as bloodletting, boil lancing, practices that were dangerous as well as unsanitary, and superstitious practices such as burning aromatic herbs and bathing in rose water or vinegar. Meanwhile, in a panic, healthy people did all they could to avoid the sick. Doctors refused to see patients, priests refused to administer last rites, and shopkeepers closed their stores. Many people fled the cities for the countryside, but even there they could not escape the disease. It affected cows, sheep, goats, pigs and chickens as well as people. In fact, so many sheep died that one of the consequences of the Black Death 
was a European wool shortage, and many people desperate to save themselves even abandoned their sick and dying loved ones. Thus doing, Boccaccio wrote, each thought to secure immunity for himself. Because they did not understand the biology of the disease, Many people believed that the Black Death was a kind of divine punishment, retribution for sins against God, such as greed, blasphemy, heresy, fornication and worldliness. By this logic, the only way to overcome the plague was to win God's forgiveness. Some people believed that the way to do this was to purge their communities of heretics and other troublemakers. So, for example, many thousands of Jews were massacred in 1348 and 1349. Thousands more fled to the sparsely populated regions of Eastern Europe, where they could be relatively safe from the rampaging mobs and in the cities. Some people coped with the terror and uncertainty of the Black Death epidemic by lashing out at their neighbours. Others coped by turning inward, and fretting about the condition of their own souls. Some upper-class men joined processions of flag flagellants that travelled from town to town and engaged in public displays of penance and punishment. They would beat themselves and one another with heavy leather straps studded with sharp pieces of metal, while the townspeople looked on. For thir 33 and a half days, the flagellants repeated this ritual three times a day. Then they would move on to the next town and begin the process over again. Though the flagellant movement did provide some comfort to people who felt powerless in the face of inexplicable tragedy, it soon began to rot worry the Pope, whose authority the flagellants had begun to usurp. In the face of this papal resistance, the movement disintegrated. The Black Death epidemic had run its course by the early 1350s, but the plague reappeared every few generations for centuries. Modern sanitation and public health practices have greatly mitigated the impact of the disease, but have not eliminated it. The Black Death was an epidemic of bubonic plague, a disease caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis, that circulates among wild rodents where they live in great numbers and density. Such an area is called a plague focus or a plague reservoir. Plague among humans arises when rodents in human habitation, normally black rats, become infected. The black rat, also called the house rat and the ship rat, likes to live close to people, the very quality that makes it dangerous. In contrast, the brown or grey rat prefers to keep its distance in sewers and cellars. Normally it takes 10 to 14 days before the plague has killed off most of the contaminated rat colony, making it difficult for great numbers of fleas gathered on the remaining, but soon dying, rats to find new hosts. After three days of fasting, hungry rat fleas turn on humans. From the bite site, the contagion drains to a lymph node that consequently swells to form a painful bubo, most often in the groin, on the thigh, in the armpit or on the neck. Hence the name bubonic plague. The infection takes three to five days to incubate in people before they fall ill, and another three to five days before, in 80% of the cases, the victims die. Thus, from the introduction of plague contagion among rats in a human community, it takes on average 23 days before the first person dies. When, for instance, a stranger called Andrew Hogson died from plague on his arrival in Penrith in 1597, and the next... When, for instance, a stranger called Andrew Hogson died from plague on his arrival in Penrith in 1597, and the next plague case followed 22 days later. This corresponded to the first phase of the development of an epidemic of bubonic plague. And Hobson was, of course, not the only fugitive from a plague-stricken town or a re area arriving in various communities in the region with an infective rat fleas on their clothing or luggage. 
This pattern of spread is called spread by leaps, or metastatic spread. Thus, plague soon broke out in other urban and rural centres, from where the disease spread into the villages and townships of the surrounding districts by a similar process of leaps. In order to become an epidemic, the disease must be spread to other rat colonies in the locality and transmitted to inhabitants in the same way. It took some time for people to recognise that a terrible epidemic was breaking out among them and for chroniclers to note this. The time scale varies. In the countryside it took about 40 days for realisation to dawn. In most towns with a few thousand inhabitants, six to seven weeks. In the cities with over 10,000 inhabitants, about seven weeks. And in the few metropolises with over 100,000 inhabitants, as much as eight weeks. Plague bacteria can break out of the buboes and be carried by the bloodstream to the lungs and cause a variant of plague that is spread by contaminated droplets from the cough of patients, pneumonic plague. However, contrary to what is sometimes believed, this form is not contracted easily, spreads normally only episodically or incidentally, and constitutes therefore normally only a small fraction of plague cases. It now appears clear that human fleas and lice did not contribute to the spread, at least not significantly. The bloodstream of humans is not invaded by plague bacteria from the buboes, or people die with so few bacteria in the blood that blood-sucking human parasites become insufficiently infected to become ineffective and spread the disease. The blood of plague-infected rats contains 500,000 times more bacteria per unit of management than the blood of plague-infected humans. Importantly, plague was spread considerable distances by rat fleas on ships. Infected ship rats would die, but their fleas was off, would often survive and find new rat hosts wherever they landed. Unlike human fleas, rat fleas are adapted to riding with their hosts. They readily also infest clothing of people entering affected houses and ride with them to other houses or localities. This gives plague epidemics a peculiar rhythm and pace of development and characteristic pattern of dissemination. The fact that plague is transmitted by rat fleas means plague is a disease of the warmer seasons, disappearing during the winter or at least lose most of their powers of spread. The peculiar season pattern of plague has been observed everywhere and is systematic feature also of the spread of the Black Death. In the plague history of Norway, from the Black Death 1348-49 to the last outbreaks in 1654, compromising over 30 waves of plague, there was never a winter epidemic of plague. Plague is a very different form, very different from airborne contagious diseases, which are spread directly between people by droplets. These thrive in cold weather. The conspicuous feature constitutes proof that the Black Death and plague in general is an insect-borne disease. Cambridge historian John Hatcher has noted that there is a remarkable transformation in the seasonal pattern of mortality in England after 1348, whilst before the Black Death, the heaviest mortality was in the winter months. In the following century, it was heaviest in the period from late July to late September. He points out that this strongly indicates that the transformation was caused by the virulence of bubonic plague. Another very characteristic feature of the Black Death and plague epidemics in general, both in the past and in the great outbreaks in the early 20th century, reflects their basis in rats and rat fleas. Much higher proportions of inhabitants contract plague and die from it in the countryside than in urban areas. In the case of English plague history, this feature has been underlined by Oxford historian Paul Slack. 
when around 90% of the population lived in the countryside, only a disease with this property combined with extreme lethal powers could cause the exceptional mortality of the Black Death and of many later plague epidemics. All diseases spread by cross-infection between humans, on the contrary, gain increasing powers of spread with increasing density of population and cause highest mortality rates in urban centres. Lastly, it could be mentioned that scholars have succeeded in extra extracting genetic evidence of the causal agents of bubonic plague, the DNA code of Yersinia pestis, from several plague burials in French cemeteries from the period 1348 to 1590. It, it used to be thought that the Black Death originated in China, but new research shows that in the spring of 1346, in the steppe region, where a plague reservoir stretches from the northwestern shores of the Caspian Sea into southern Russia. People occasionally contract plague there even today. Two contemporary chroniclers identify the estuary of the river Don, where it flows into the Sea of Azov, as the area of original outbreak. But this could be mere hearsay, and it is possible that it started elsewhere perhaps in the area estuary of the river Volga on the Caspian Sea. At the time, this area was under the rule of Mongol Khanate of the Golden Horde. Some decades earlier, the Mongol Khanate had converted to Islam, and the presence of Christians or trade with them was no longer tolerated. As a result, the Silk Road caravan routes between China and Europe were cut off, for the same reason that the Black Death did not spread from the east through Russia towards Western Europe, but stopped abruptly on the Mongol border with the Russian principalities. As a result, Russia, which might have become the Black Death's first European conquest, in fact was its last, and was invaded by the disease not from the east, but from the west. The epidemic, in fact, began with an attack that the Mongols launched on the Italian merchants. Last trading station in the region, Kaffa, today Fiodasia, in the Crimea. In the autumn of 1346, plague broke out among the besiegers and from them penetrated into the town. When spring arrived, the Italians fled on their ships and the Black Death slipped unnoticed aboard and sailed with them. The extent of the contagious power of the Black Death has been almost mystifying. The central explanation lies within characteristic features of medieval society. In a dynamic phase of modernization heralding the transformation from a medieval to an early modern European society, Early industrial market economic and capitalistic developments had advanced more than is often assumed, especially in northern Italy and Flanders. New, larger types of ship carried great quantities of goods over extensive trade networks that linked Venice and Genoa with Constantinople and Crimea. Alexandria and Tunis, London and Bruges, in London and Bruges, the Italian trading system was linked to the busy shipping lines of the German Hasiatic League in the Nordic countries and the Baltic area, with large broad-bellied ships called COGS. This system for long-distance trade was supplemented by a web of lively short- and medium-distance trade that bound together the populations all over the world. <clears throat> The strong increase in population in Europe in the High Middle Ages, 1050 to 1300, meant that the prevailing agricultural technology was inadequate for further expansion. To accommodate the growth, forests were cleared and mountain villages settled wherever it was possible for people to eke out a living. People had to opt for a more one-sided husbandry, particularly in animals to create a surplus that could be traded for staples such as salt and iron, grain or flour. These settlements operated within a 
busy trading network of running from coasts to mountain villages, and with tradesmen and goods, contagious diseases reached even the most remote and isolated hamlets. In this early phase of modernization, Europe was also on the way to the golden age of bacteria, when there was a great increase in epidemic diseases caused by increases in population density and in trade and transport, while knowledge of the nature of epidemics and therefore the ability to organize efficient countermeasures to them was still minimal. Most people believe plague and mass illness to be a punishment from God for their sins. They responded with religious penitential acts aimed at tempering the Lord's wrath, or with passivity and fatalism. It was a sin to try and avoid God's will. Much new can be said on the Black Death's patterns of territorial spread. Of particular importance was the sudden appearance of the plague over vast distances, due to its rapid transportation by ship. Ships travelled at an average speed of around 40 kilometres a day, which today seems quite slow. However, this speed meant that the Black Death easily moved 600 kilometres in a fortnight by ship, spreading in contemporary terms with astonishing speed and unpredictability. By land, the average spread was much slower, up to 2 kilometres a day along the busiest highways or roads, or about 0.6 kilometres per day, along secondary lines of communication. As already noted, the pace spread slowed strongly during the winter and stopped completely in mountain areas such as the Alps and in northerly parts of Europe. Yet the Black Death op often rapidly established two or more fronts and conquered countries by advancing from various quarters. This dramatic fall in Europe's population became a lasting and characteristic feature of late medieval society. As subsequent plague epidemics swept away all tendencies of population growth, inevitably it had an enormous impact on European society and greatly affected the dynamics of change and development from the medieval to early modern period. A historical turning point as well as a vast human tragedy. So then, what's it all about? We've seen we had some early plagues back in about 150 AD, then again in about 600, then we had the one in the 1300s. And what was going on back then? People were moving into cities. That's where they were affected the most, in highly populated areas. Now how were living, people living before that? Well, a lot of them were making their own houses out of sticks. And they'd have a little fire inside and They'd be constantly keeping that fire going for warmth and cooking, warming up water, lots of things. They'd constantly be around wood smoke. Now recently we've been told that wood smoke is bad for us. It contains over a hundred things that are known to cause cancer, da 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 da. Like smoking. In fact, they now say that wood smoke is worse than tobacco. So we're making a very good case that actually inhaling wood smoke or tobacco smoke into your lungs actually could save your life. These sorts of diseases are spread in the air get into the lungs and the wood smoke and tobacco 
the nasty things there can actually help you, can actually kill these more nasty things which will otherwise kill you. So, should we be really tempted to talk about t tobacco as something bad when it quite possibly saved the human population from being completely wiped out. And if we can't get tobacco, get some wood, make a little fire <laughs> and allow some of that smoke in your lungs especially during the summer, if you know what's good for you. Ciao.